All right, let's get started with the next debate, which is, should licenses be designed to advance general social goals? We have John Sullivan, Molly DeBlanc, James Vazil, Josh Simmons, Dash Renault. So I will uh, give the mic to I'm, uh, first. John Sullivan, who's going to start. Fabulous. The first affirmative. Okay. I, but I have a mic, right? I have a mic. It's working. Is this working? I would hand it to you, but it will burn me if I touch it. <laughs> Let me get my timer in. You go right side. <laughs> yeah. Literally and, and metaphorically. <laughs> and I'll, I'll hold up. We're live. I'll hold up the spot right here. I'll leave the oh, Okay. okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm John Sullivan, the executive director and vice president of the Free Software Foundation. Uh, but like the slide says, uh, what I'm saying here has no relation to what I actually think individually or what the FSF thinks. Um, I want to say that in the November issue of the FSF bulletin newsletter, I actually wrote an article that starts to try and address some of these topics. So if you're looking for what I actually think, um, that's, a, that's a good place to look. But I very much appreciate this debate format. Um, I think it helps me understand other people's feelings, perspectives, and positions a lot better. It helps me determine my own positions um, it helps improve my critical thinking, and believe me, it, that needs a lot of improvement. Um, so with all that in mind, uh, Molly Dash and uh, I stand resolved that, yes, licenses should be designed to advance general social goals. <laughs> <clears throat> We're discussing this topic uh, because there have been multiple new licenses written, uh, which are largely in the spirit of free software, and that they allow uh, much more sharing, modification, and use than typical default copyright law allows um, but they also include provisions seeking to prevent certain harms to society, the environment, humanity. Um, and we're not here to necessarily defend any of the particular licenses or even the idea that the best approach is to tackle these problems through individual separate licenses. Um, but I want to run down some quick examples of uh, some of the recent ones and the harms that they're seeking to address, kind of set the stage for what we're talking about. So we have the problem of climate change, um, which as we know will end the planet unless we do something. Citation needed, but sure, but look at the weather outside at FOSDEM, that's not right. <laughs> we all know it. Um, the atmosphere license that uh, Lewis mentioned seeks to address this by requiring you to divest certain kinds of investments uh, in fossil fuels if you want to use the software, the precondition. Second of all, we have labor exploitation. Uh, the NT996 license, which is immensely popular, I think it's the number two starred project on GitHub right now. Um, says you cannot use the software unless you comply with good labor standards, which do not include forcing your employees to work 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. Uh, licenses are supposed to ensure that people have freedom while using the software, but can we really say that people being forced to work 72 hours a week uh, have the freedom necessary to have the freedom to modify, uh, share, distribute software, as compared to the people who have power over them who can, in fact, use that software um, to enhance their exploitation over the people they already had some amount of control over. And we have vaccines. Uh, we have infectious diseases. We know they have caused a you know, massive amount of death over history. That's, uh, that's why we have vaccines and, and why people take them. People refusing to take vaccines uh, cause other people, put other people at risk of dying. The vaccine license says you have to get vaccinated and make sure that everybody under your legal control also gets vaccinated before you can use the software. Uh, the final one example I have is militarization, that militaries and police departments uh, are actually using free software to violate other people's rights and kill them. Uh, that's not good. So various licenses seek to forbid that specific use of the software or distribution to entities known to engage in that kind of uh, activity. We need, we need to be reasonably, we need to be alive and we need to be reasonably healthy in order to have any kind of meaningful freedom when we're interacting with software. If we're dead, we don't have software freedom. Uh, nor if we're melting or you know, drowning from sea level rise. Um, we also need to be free in other ways uh, in order to be able to exercise our software freedom. 
And we need our militaries and we need our police forces to behave ethically in order to have a, a democratic society to begin with. So what we're seeing with these licenses is that, is that you know, first of all, they use the law to prevent uh, the software from being used directly for bad things. And second of all, they're doing things to create incentives or leverage to discourage bad behavior and encourage good behavior. You can't use the software unless you act in a certain way which is beneficial to society um, and important for avoiding really catastrophic kinds of, of harm. And yes, there are other ways to address these problems. There are laws, uh, there's economic incentives, our purchasing power, boycotts, things like that. But just because there are other tools doesn't mean we shouldn't use all the tools that we have available, especially when the consequences are so extreme uh, and especially uh, because we can use multiple things in parallel, they don't compete with each other. And in fact, people are turning to software licenses because other kinds of tools are not working or are not working fast enough. And software licenses are something that individuals have very direct control over and also make a very clear statement. If you decide not to buy, McDonald's does not know that I do not eat at McDonald's, I promise you. Uh, that is not sending them any kind of message. But if I put their name in a software license and they see that, then they know exactly what kind of behavior you know, I or another developer is objecting to. Um, and let's remember also that companies aren't people. They don't have individual rights uh, because they don't have the accountability that comes with an individual rights either. And also, even when it comes to individuals, we accept certain kinds of restrictions on our freedom in the interest of, private, in the interest of safety and security. You can't shout fire in a crowded theater, uh, and you can't use my software to destroy the planet. Uh, these licenses indicate that people are very interested in the ethics of technology and software, things that are you know, at the heart of free software. So to tell these new ethical hacker, hackers to get off our lawn and go read new.org slash philosophy is uh, not gonna help. Um, we should encourage their participation even if we think that it might be imperfect. And you know, maybe if we listen instead of talk, uh, then if we're welcoming, these social goal licenses will end up being a stepping stone towards traditional free licenses, like some people argue that Creative Commons non-commercial licenses are a way to get people more accustomed to the idea of sharing their work more, and then eventually they become more comfortable enough to use fully free licenses. And, you know, sure, there might be some problems with this approach. The negative team will tell us all about them, but I don't think these problems will be world-ending or threatening the planet on a, on a global scale, uh, and I think the problems that we're talking about actually are. So, we better try harder, and we should use licenses to do it. John does eat at McDonald's all the time. I don't believe. Who would like to go across? Okay, I'll get him a mic. This is, oh, here it is. Okay. All very, very persuasive. Hmm. <laughs> uh, the first question that I, that I have for you uh, draws on a question that came up a little earlier in the previous discussion, which is uh, how do we handle shifting norms around ethics? Uh, because sometimes ethics shift uh, in a positive direction, sometimes they regress, mm -hmm. and that depends on where you are in the world as well. Um, if we are to codify ethics in a license, um, how do, we, how do we make room for the fact that those things are going to drift over time? As they are now. As they are yeah, I think that's a fair question, but I don't think it's that much different from how we deal with that in our laws. You know, and I, I think that licenses, in fact, are, are more flexible than many other kinds of instruments that try to address ethical questions, you know, religious texts, foundational philosophical texts, statutes. These things all have to be revisited, and I think that we've had the benefit of living with software licenses, free software licenses that have had great staying power and been around for a long time, but it, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. We could put out a new edition of a GPL every year. <laughs> that sounds very representative. <laughs> Along those same lines, uh, how do we, if, if, if we are to make room for advancing general social goals through licenses, mm -hmm. uh, how do we prevent uh, regressive ethics uh, from from entering those licenses. So, what do you mean by regressive? So, ethic uh, license that may be uh, given the culture that it's created in might restrict uh, reproductive autonomy, for instance. Uh -huh. 
Well, I think that's it's kind of similar to the first question in that you know ethics are their territory for disagreement, and we have to have ways to you know have conversations about that. And on one hand, you know licenses, there's other people will not use them unless they agree with the stances that are taken there. So there's kind of the basic democracy aspect, and then maybe we have bodies that are responsible for you know, uh, that are end up being trusted for making decisions about which kinds of provisions are acceptable in licenses. Uh, and which aren't, and the conversations can happen under their umbrella. So lastly, as we pursue uh, more ethical technology and, and more just world, uh, which are all laudable goals, uh, how do we uh, work against, how do we weigh against the unintended consequences, knowing that there are projects that are built on the foundations of the four freedoms and the open source definition today that are making a dent in these problems? How do we, how do we know that uh, adding ethics to the licenses will not uh, adversely uh, detract from those efforts that already exist? Um, well, we, we have to, I mean, that's, that's kind of the question about keeping them up to date and revising them, <laughs> I think. Uh, thanks, Josh. Thank you. Let's do the first negative. Do you like that one? Oh, no, this is fine. Okay. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that we're ready for GPLv4. I have some ideas. <laughs> Seven minutes of ideas. <laughs> so it, it has become uh, fashionable to start this talk with a disclaimer that you know, I don't really believe any of the things I'm about to say. I barely mean these words as they come out of my mouth. You cannot hold me to them at any point in time. So we've had a lot of community discussion over the last few months around this question of what is the role of ethics in licenses? What is the right place to locate ethics in our community? And nobody up here, and probably nobody in the audience, thinks that there is a reason why we should not have any ethics at all in the work that we do. And the question really today is just, why would we put them in licenses, or why wouldn't we put them in licenses? And our position on this side of the stage is that the licenses are the wrong place to put the ethics because there are better places and putting the ethics in the licenses makes your job harder, not easier. It's not only less effective than some of these other ways of going about it, it's ineffective. So let me talk about that a little bit, right? We have all of these licenses, right? And I know people in this room really care about licenses, but I don't give a shit about licenses. I think licenses are kind of stupid. I've spent a lot of time thinking about them, I've spent a lot of time working on them, and I regret every second of it. <laughs> I have wasted years of my life thinking about the least consequential end of the free and open source software world. Right? The, the magic in the freedom we get is not in the freedom, it's what we do with it. It's in the collaboration that we have, it's in the people we meet, we talk to, we work with, we get to do things together that are greater than what we could ever do alone, and it's not because of licenses. We don't really use the licenses. Half an hour ago, people tried to recite the four freedoms. The people on the stage tried to recite the four freedoms, and it was a lot of, uh, I, I, I don't know if I can count that high. I can't recite the four freedoms. I don't know what they are. I've read the licenses. Every time I have a question about them, I have to go back to them. Who here has actually read GPLv3 all the way through? Liars! <laughs> Liars! All of you, put your hands down. Even if you did read it, I bet you just skimmed it. And I bet you didn't even understand it, because it's not written to be comprehensible. Right? We have these licenses. They're like flags that we wave. We point at them, we, think they, we all think we know what they mean, but they each mean a different thing to each of us. We have no common understanding of what they mean because we never test the damn things. We never take them to court, we never litigate them. right? Even when we do, it's a quagmire that we just want to get out of as soon as we get in. Sorry, Bradley. <laughs> the whole point of the licenses, when we get involved in them, is not that we're going to use them to change the world to make everything better. The point of the licenses is to have a common point around which we can gather and start working together. And what truly controls the behavior of the people around the licenses 
is the norms and the communities that cohere around them. When we get together, we decide in this project the GPL means X, in that project the GPL means Y. And they're different things, right? People disagree about what these licenses mean, and that's okay, because in each community where you want to participate, you adopt the local definition, you adopt the local norms about all kinds of things, both what's in the license and what's not, right? The, the codes of standards of behavior, the way people are going to interact with each other, just the method of getting a pull request into a project, those are all norms that aren't in the license. We enforce those norms by saying, if you want to come play with our community, if you want to access the value, the magic of the collaboration, if you want to be here with us, you have to behave in a certain way. And the licenses are not what makes that happen. It's the community that makes that happen. If you want to enforce ethical norms and standards of behavior around your software, the answer is to build strong communities where there is so much value in participating in that community as a first-class participant that you are going to collaborate alongside with those norms. That is how we have always done license enforcement. That is how we have always done community enforcement around codes of conduct and behavior and ethics in all sorts of ways that have, that have preceded the current set of conversations. So that is what we are standing for on this side of the stage, is just that notion that if you want to do licenses, you have to ground it in your community. We don't enforce the licenses. We don't actually use that text for anything. Nobody understands what that text is. And so we all end up falling back to this notion of community. And it's not perfect, right? There's always going to be places where that's going to end, where your community does not have the power and the control. But the same is true of the licenses, right? Most of the time when there's license violations, nothing ever gets done about it. The vast majority of software that doesn't comply with the licenses we just let it go because the cost of fighting is so high, because the cost of collaboration is so low. And so we end up at a place where if you want ethical enforcement, putting it in the license is pointless unless you have the community behind you. Putting it in the license is pointless unless you have a strong community that is worth participating in. So why put it in the license? What do you get out of it? If you get nothing out of it, what does it cost you? It costs you the rigidity of being stuck with a bunch of license terms that might meet the needs of your community today, but might not tomorrow, right? When we were working on GPLv3, Linus famously said that he couldn't adopt it even if he wanted to. Now, I think he didn't really want to, but the point is that he had this large community of people behind him, and getting all of them to sign off on moving to v3 was a non-starter. V2 had included a bunch of ethical clauses that were no longer relevant to his community, he stuck with them, right? So that's the problem with licenses. They're rigid, they're friction. Once you start trying to enforce them, you're talking to lawyers who are not doing you any favors. They're just getting in the way of actually getting people talking directly to each other, which is where the community conversation needs to happen. Thank you. Uh, given, that I given that I was name checked, I, I would love to do the cross, but I am just the moderator. I believe Dash from the affirmative side will be doing the cross. <laughs> Thank you, Bradley. Oh. Um, oh, am I still up? Yes, yes. Thank you, James. So question to you, James. Are all users of open source software ethical? <laughs> yes. Yes, they are. All users of open source software. Exxon, for instance. I mean, in their use of free software, if they're complying with the license, I think they're, doing, they're, they're meeting their ethical obligations. A comprehensive ethical obligations. Like beyond the license? Yeah. Oh, no, the license goes as far as, you know, what the license covers. And is climate change a good thing? No, definitely not. Is child labor a good thing? <laughs> no. <laughs> if you knew that a company was employing child labor, would you have standing to do anything about that? I certainly wouldn't. If you, if that company was using software that you had licensed to them under a license that prevents anyone from using the license software should they employ child labor, would you not have standing then to enforce that against that company? I don't think I really would have any ability to do anything about it. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a child labor crusader, right? I don't have access to 
a whole bunch of lawyers at my disposal who are going to fight that battle for me. I don't have access to any of the resources I would need to fully understand the situation to even get into that conversation. The notion that I, as a random free software hacker who happens to have commits in that tree, and the software happens to be used by this company, is going to have the ability to even begin legal process, let alone litigate that process through to a conclusion that harms them more than them just saying, screw it, we'll rewrite your commits, is farcical, right? Exxon is not going to say, oh, oh, James has 300 lines of code in that tree. We better listen to him. No, they're going to hire some guy to rewrite those 300 lines and tell me to go screw off. So, right? sorry. There's, no, there's no scenario in the world in which I become some sort of effective social justice crusader for children's rights because I have a few commits in a tree. So, it's, just, it's, a, it's, a, it's a power fantasy that developers have that their free software is this giant lever that can change the world in ways that it's just not realistic. It's just not any, any way that's going to happen. So are you You're suggesting going to complicate all the licenses <laughs> for the sake of this fantasy. It doesn't make any sense. This is a good deba so, debate sorry. tactic, drowning out the questions. It's really I smart. I apologize. Go, go ahead. Uh, but no, I mean, so are you suggesting then that it only applies to um, software for which you're a small developer, that it, indeed if you had developed a piece of software that Exxon could not simply rewrite your commits out of, that everything that you just said then would not apply? I think it would be really difficult to find a developer with that kind of level of uh, level of contribution. Certainly, I, I don't know of any. And and sorry, last question: How does putting ethics in licenses make them make your job harder? Yeah. How does? Well, I guess you don't have any chance. Can I answer? No. No. Well, we'll can I? Uh, the, this one, um, because I need two hands. So this, um, is, this is uh, Molly for the second okay. affirmative seven minutes. Seven minutes. Um, and those mics don't work if you don't have pockets. Uh, so I would like to lead off with the statement that James made an argument against licenses in general. Um, and I think that's an important thing to address because software freedom in the first place uh, is based on licenses and copyright um, in order to make those things happen. So I want to kind of lay the basis to begin with that we do need licenses. Um, and I think that's a great place to start. Uh, I'd also like to respond to the comments about the power of developers. Um, so for example, the Hillary for America campaign was using Debian for some of their stuff. Uh, the International Space Station uses Debian. Um, government organizations use Debian and build software off of Debian. So if it's the case that that actual piece of software is that important, it's been in development for a significant number of years, creating an easy replacement for it is not so easy. Um, so by a large project making that adoption, you're creating like a major use case, uh, and that's really important. Um, Sorry, I'm not quite ready. Oh, um, uh, reaching out to communities uh, to encourage building a commons is possible. So one of the other things is the comment that like we're going to need to reach out to new communities to get them involved, and it is possible, right? So you have people who are currently not developing in this sphere and not participating because they're concerned about use. So suddenly, not just talking about definitions of freedom and openness, we're building a commons that we weren't capable of building before. Um, five minutes left, okay. Um, uh, great. Um, in addition to that, I would like to make some comments in support of what John had said, um, which are noted on my phone somewhere. Great, no, that's not it. Wow, thanks for your patience, everyone. This is not. Uh, great. Anyway, um, let's see what I remember. Um, so uh, from the environmental perspective, um, I would like to add that we look at software um, in terms of one of the ways we can look at software and environmental impact is things like processing speed and server load um, and making significant changes to make our software more uh, efficient will have positive environmental impact. So it's easy to argue that that will be more effective if you have free and open source software. But in addition to that, you're going to be able uh, to better reduce that load because you're going to have pe more people focusing on it since it's a thing that they care about, right? Um, 
in response to the concept of military and police use. Um, so one of the things that happens, should we reach a point where things like facial, facial recognition technology and different surveillance technologies are under free and open licenses, they're going to become better and more effective. And this creates an even greater threat from police forces, right? So if we're able to build into those forced ethics, it's going to make a bigger difference for these individual communities out there and the people who are already at risk, right? In terms of labor practices, um, we see abuse of labor um, all over the world, uh, like and and things that limit labor, right? So one example I really like is in Saudi Arabia how there's a culture of women being unable to work, um, especially with like without support from their husbands or their fathers, um, and by creating licenses that ensure this sort of behavior, we're creating an opportunity for them to participate in the creation of these comments. Um, I'd like to add that one of the things people have brought up is the um, confusion of licenses and the incompatibility of licenses, right? There's nothing to say that you have to create licenses that are incompatible. And there's nothing to say that you need to have 50 different licenses, each addressing a different social issue. Um, I would propose the adoption of a Creative Commons based model um, where there is a base license written off of which people can add things. Um, so that would mean that you can have your no ice clause and you can have your uh, no child labor clause and you can have your equal, like equity and equal participation clause. Um, how much time do I have? Okay, great. Um, you can add those clauses without uh, forcing yourself uh, to deal with incompatibility in the same ways, right? Um, and I would go as far to argue that while ethics change and what society views as ethics change, the ethics of individual contributors might not change as much. Um, so they're able to own these decisions and choose how their software is being used, um, but also how their software uh, is affecting the world and having an impact. Now, I think the, like, the obvious question to that is like, what if somebody creates a like only Nazis clause? Um, and I would like to immediately address uh, that that sort of problem is something that we can deal with uh, managing by things like forking projects, um, by looking, Karen's frowning at me. Are you sure? Okay. Um, and making adjustments uh, and building code and all those other wonderful things. Um, so uh, in general, I think there's a lot of opportunity to reinforce the good uh, that licenses can do. And like in, a, in another like immediate response, um, I believe licenses can have teeth. And I believe that licensing is really important, not just because it creates and ensures software freedom in the first place, but because it has impact even when things like uh, employment pressure, like pressure from employees doesn't work. Like let's look at Google. Google fired people who were doing organizing for their company. Obviously, like companies maintain power, right? And companies maintain uh, control over our access to things we need to survive, um, like healthcare uh, in some countries. Sorry, I know Europe different than the U.S. Um, uh, salaries, which uh, for which are what enable us to buy the things we need. Um, so companies will have more power. Uh, companies do have more power when there aren't forced ethics. Okay. Hit so, me with your best shot. Okay, so now I have cross-examination from the negative side. Who from the negative side would like to cross? No, I thought you were going to do it. Uh, no, I'm not. I, I, I would like to, but I am the moderator. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Three minutes, please. I'm ready. All right. So... You mentioned earlier that Debian could change its license and force NASA and everyone else to suddenly adopt something. I'm not sure what. Um, but what are the practical ways that it could do that? How many tens of thousands of people would it take to get on board in order to, to change Debian's licensing? Well, I, uh, I think you could run a general resolution. Uh, to manage that. I'm not positive. I should know this. And in which case, you'd only need a significant percentage of a thousand people to agree to that decision. And then you cross off some who won't vote. Um, so I think it's uh, possible 
for Debian to make a decision like that. So, so Debian can relicense all the software in Debian with, with a vote of the Debian people? I think it can relicense a certain amount of software. These are things I'm not sure about. Like these are guesses on my behalf. Um, but like the project itself has a lot of power. The individuals in it have a lot of power, and any member of the project can put forth a general resolution to make a significant change to the community. So, for example, instead of relicensing the whole project, they could make the decision to pass a general resolution that will mean all future packages and all future work are required to be under one of these ethical licenses. If Companies already have decided that they are avoiding things like copyleft. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you go about convincing them to adopt one of these licenses that have the ethical clause? That's a really good question. Um, I think because, because companies are afraid of copyleft, and I have lots of stories about that, um, and I'm sure people here have even more. Um, but uh, when you're looking, especially if we can look at the foundational technologies, and the things that we're using as the basis on which we're building everything, then suddenly it matters a lot more who is putting these requirements onto things. Um, now, the, well, no, I won't tell you what question you should ask me next in response to that. No, no please go ahead. No, no, it's good, it's all you, all you. So I, I think my last question really is, if you really need communities in order to do this enforcement, how does locking yourself into one rigid framework around a license help you when what you really need is that community power in the first place? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I think one, there are social issues that we need to handle at a time scale that's a lot shorter than things that can be um, accomplished by having a community make enforcement and make social changes uh, I think we can say with high confidence that there are terrible people in all communities um, and that social norms aren't being enforced uh, to change that. So by having something like licenses, you are forcing a very sudden change. So now we have the second negative uh, construction. That's going to be done by Josh Simmons. Thank you. Constructive. I'm new to this debate stuff. <laughs> Okay, disclaimer, right? Let's start with that. So first, I wanna say that uh, I think we all share a desire for a more ethical and just world. Uh, I think that is something that we have broad alignment on. Uh, however, I am here to persuade you further that licenses are not the way to go about this. First, I just want to ask the audience a question. How many here, by a show of hands, think that your code of ethics are universalizable to everybody everywhere? <laughs> bold, bold. <laughs> Real realistically, realistically, I'm not here to make an argument for moral rel relativism. I think that's a sticky wicket. But I do think that ethics are complicated and that they're highly localized and that what's right for us here may not be right for people everywhere. And even though there are, there's much to be said about their, the organizations like the United Nations who have definitions of human rights which are reasonably universal, uh, I don't know that we can truly trust these organizations to maintain those definitions in good faith. I mean, this, this is going to be an easy one. Who thinks the United Nations is a good thing? Yeah, right? But, but how many people feel good about the efficacy of the United Nations? Exactly, okay. So along those lines, uh, you know, I also wanna note that the United Nations has, a, has this, this, this way of governing such that you could have a single bad actor, a single nation state say no to a proposal to limit uh, a really important expansion of rights. Thus, I don't think that we should hinge ethics in licenses on, uh, on, on a United Nations or uh, other body. Similarly, there's the American Civil, Civil Liberties Union or the Red Cross. Only one of those really has opinions about ethics, but both of them do uh, valuable philanthropic work. However, neither of them are an, an unalloyed good. Both of those organizations have a history of causing legitimate harm 
as well as all the good that they're doing. I don't think that we can outsource our ethics because there's no institution that we can rely on to truly capture this. Now, do no harm, do, do no harm style licenses, ethical licenses, we, we can't capture all of the ethics in these licenses, and so I think we would need to outsource them to organizations. And to my earlier point, I don't think there's a single organization that we can really trust to do that. Further, I want to say a little bit about the unenforceability here. You know, there's even people who are proponents of ethical licenses concede that these things would be very, very difficult to enforce. Can you really legislate these in a court of law? TBD, we really don't know. But even if you could, who would? The amount of enforcement action that's happening today is practically nil. And so using licenses as a vehicle, that just seems like an ineffective strategy. And then there's the issue of vagueness. You know, some licenses are well-crafted. Most of them, not so much. And a lot of these things leave a lot of room for, uh, leave a lot of room for interpretation. And uh, as far as I understand it, uh, judges don't like it when people are trying to be clever. And if something is vague and arguable, well, you're not going to be able to make a convincing case in the first place. I also want to note that there is more than one ethical framework. The most well-trained ethicists understand that for any sticky problem, we need to bring multiple ethical frameworks to bear on that issue in order to really see our way through it, such that, in most cases, we need to approach ethical, ethical decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. It's really not universalizable. We cannot capture this complexity in a license. And I want to speak to some of the harms that people have, have noted, potential harms. One of the reasons that we have the four freedoms and the open source definition, and we have these organizations that uh, steward licenses generally, is to limit license proliferation. We limit license proliferation so that we can encourage adoption of a standard that gives, a, a, gives, us, gives us a solid baseline from which we can build on. To the point about, incompat about compatibility. It may be that we can design a license that provides a, a solid foundation and we can have these additional uh, layers on top of it for you know, no ice or no child labor or uh, nine to six. But if we do that, do the components with those different licenses, are those interoperable? I think that's an open question and I think that's one that we need to answer before we experiment here. I also want to note that I, I think that this has the potential to drive down adoption of open source and free, free software and limit the very real good that's already happening through things like humanitarian free and open source software. We've got Sahana and Usahidi for disaster response, My, MyFoss Initiative for the Unbanked, Libre Health for Health Systems in the Developing World, Water Project and Open Air Quality for Detecting Pollution. We have projects that are making a difference in all of these spaces that people are raising rightly raising concerns about the projects that are addressing them using the existing frameworks. I think that licenses are an ineffective vehicle and a vehicle that could cause unintended consequences. I think the other proposals, the other options that we have on the table are the ones that we should really be pursuing. Now I'm all for an all of the above approach. We are faced with extraordinarily massive challenges at this time in our, in our existence. We should try all of the things. Let's throw the spaghetti at the wall and figure it out. But I'm of the opinion that even though we may try with licenses, that is not the right vehicle. Codes of conduct, refusing to support, accept issues, poor requests from bad actors, refusing to grant use of the project trademark. Hell, seeking regulation from governments, doing labor organizing so that we can say no when we're asked to do something that we know is wrong. Thank you. All right, we're going to have cross-examination from the affirmative. Who from the, the side is going to do it? Yes. You, Dash? All righty. Um, okay, so uh, first off, um, so if, if, if the point, if we shouldn't be enforcing licenses at all, what, what are we doing here? I mean, specifically in this room, in the legal and policy room, at Fostown. 
I didn't say we shouldn't be enforcing licenses. Okay. I think we should have more enforcement, frankly. Okay, what does it matter if ethics are localized? Because aren't licenses personal to the author? Shouldn't it only be a question of whether the ethics embodied by the license are those that the author releasing their work under that license would want them to be? You know, I think every author has the prerogative to license things the way they see fit, and I think that's, that's right and proper. However, the whole point of ethical licenses, as I understand it, is to move the needle in the world at large. And so if it's only uh, addressing the concerns of that author, but limiting the possibility for their, their software to be adopted by other people, then they're cutting off their nose to spite their face. I'm, I'm curious as to what you think as to why that would be limiting, but I've got some other questions, so I'll proceed. You, you mentioned the UN. Can the UN sue you for something unethical you did? I have no idea. I don't think so. I believe the answer is no. I didn't research that, but I believe the answer is no. Whereas if a licensor had licensed software to you on ethical terms and you had breached those, would the licensor be able to sue you for that? I believe so. Presumably, yes. So it seems that licenses, ethical licenses then offer a lever that are larger than perhaps these other community pressures and you know, organizations that I, we look I to. I will note that though the UN may not be able to sue me, the UN does have, uh, does have mechanisms for exerting pressure. And so would you concede then that a bad actor can be pressured by positive actors to change their behavior? Yes, and that's why I made many alternative proposals. Okay, and if someone was to kill me, for instance, they could be tried for murder, correct? Yes. So if they could be tried for murder, <laughs> why would there also be a framework for my family to bring a wrongful death suit? It seems that you're arguing that if there's an existing framework for addressing a problem, that redundant frameworks aren't necessary. I think that grossly mischaracterizes my argument. <laughs> okay, oh, I'll, I'll take that. Um, well, would you, like to, would you like to reinstate what you meant then by saying that there are better mechanisms than licenses? Why can't licenses also exist as a mechanism to reinforce what is already exists to police ethics? Because they are friction, they are rigid, they are difficult to change, because there are better mechanisms that we could uh, have di disproportionate impact with. And so uh, you mentioned that licenses are ineffective. How are they ineffective? Well, let's look at the level of enforcement action. Okay, and then uh, I guess finally, sorry, I'm trying to struggling with this. Um, I've got to admire this. this so why, why, why does it that ethics have to be vague? So uh, both teams have agreed to do only one rebuttal so we can get the question. So we'll have the first uh, negative rebuttal, I think. Is that right? Yeah. So who would like to do that? Yeah, you can use yeah. whichever one you want. I think what this comes down to for us, really, is that the effort you put in to putting all the stuff in licenses might theoretically, if a whole bunch of improbable things happen, eventually result in somebody somewhere being pressured to act for the public good. And the list of things you would have to do that would have to go right is just kind of amazingly long and, and impractical, right? You'd have to convince communities to adopt it. And maybe you could do that. That actually seems like there are definitely some communities that will do it. I mean, there's, there are certainly some free software communities that want to consign themselves to irrelevancy in one fell swoop. I believe that that is true. Then you would have to get knowledge of a violation, understand it well enough, begin some sort of process to address it, have that process fail, begin some sort of enforcement process, have these clauses even recognized anywhere in the world as valid and enforced and reach a point, litigate something all the way to a conclusion, and then try to enforce a judgment. That's a lot of steps, really improbable steps. I don't know many free software projects that have that many steps. It's not a cost-free process to get there, right? The, the notion that we will get benefit out of this is all very theoretical, very attenuated, and you end up with a rather small effect out the other end in isolated instances. But you pay a big cost for that, right? Every 
license bifurcation that splits a community into two, where we've got the same piece of software being written 20 times for 20 different ethical license offshoots, and none of them are compatible with each other because the climate license says your stuff has to be climate compatible, and the labor license says your stuff has to be labor compatible, and those two can't cooperate with each other, right? The cost of splitting these communities is very high. The only reason free software works so well, why it's on the ascendancy in the way it is, is because we've created this massive pool of common value that is worth accessing. If you split those into smaller pools, they become tiny puddles that we can just hop over. That's not gonna work. At the end of the day, if you want ethics, if you want ethical use of technology, you have to do it without the shortcuts. You have to do the organizing. You have to do the community building. There are no cheat codes here. So if you want ethics, go back to your communities and talk to them about what your community is worth and why it is worth being in that community. That is how we're going to win this battle, not by writing a bunch of rules. Thank you. So we have the final affirmative rebuttal. But, yeah, because we, we, you agreed that we, do the, that we forgo the last rebuttal for audience, remember? Yeah. You agreed at the beginning. <laughs> you have notes. Yeah. I apologize if you didn't agree. Okay. Feel free to jump in. Okay. Go ahead. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, so the world's going to end. We know that. Uh, we really need to try to do something about this. Um, I understand, and I feel uh, it's. The concerns for free software as a model are serious if we start thinking about adding new things to it. But um, I also think the free software has succeeded because, because it, it's an ethical foundation. And that's why people who have, uh, when to achieve other social goals, are turning to our free software licenses to modify them to try to achieve different goals. It's that ethical foundation that's bringing people to it. You know, it's, it's GitHub that made collaboration tangibly easy, not the four freedoms. Uh, the four freedoms. <laughs> The four freedoms uh, are the ethical foundation, and that's why people are interested in what we're doing. Now, will these licenses be enforced? Uh, maybe, maybe not, but I think they will be more likely to be enforced than, uh, than copyleft licenses, for example, because they're embodying uh, things that are very tangible and immediate harms that people will feel very strongly about. But as we know, even if they're not enforced, they still serve a, a, a strong function. I think the, the argument about community norms is actually an argument for having ethical for, for having social goals addressed in license drafting um, because that enables different communities to more concretely define the ethical reasons and the social reasons that they're working together. Would we have incompatibilities? Maybe, but remember that people can release their work under more than one license at the same time and make them available for all of the causes that they care about. We also still have the option of having an omnibus license and a body that vets you know, different parts, what can be added to that. And really, what's the cost of incompatibility anyway? It just means that someone has to write code that really they shouldn't have to write because it's already out there. Well, that's not as big of a deal as global warming. So I think we can stomach it. Um, you know, and I'm also a little bit confused because free software is an ethical value. These things that we're talking about are ethical values. So kind of every argument against the rigidity of an ethical value or the you know, ability to come to agreement on these things, to me, is an argument also against free software in general. You know, how are we able to agree on any ethical value? Why is it free software alone that gets to be the rigid ethical value, um, but not opposing labor exploitation? Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, we have laws that are very complicated to enforce, um, but they still get enforced, and they still serve a deterrent effect, even though you can also list all the steps that you have to go through for a police, you know, a police officer to catch somebody doing something, prove it in court, not make any mistakes along the way, not have any appeals succeed. Like enforcing any law is a really difficult thing. We think we can do that with licenses as well. Fundamentally, we think we need to try, and specifically, we should try in the drafting stage, see what happens. We know a lot of people want these licenses, so adoption really isn't a concern. People have already asked them for them, and they're already doing them. Thank you.
So, so I want to thank both the teams again for, for going their final rebuttal, rebuttals to have, uh, to have audience questions. I'm going to ask them that more than any other debate we've had today, this slide obviously applies. Um, but I'm going to ask uh, uh, everyone to stay in character for the audience questions, if you don't mind, because I think it'll be more fun. Uh, uh, Fontana's going to bring around this mic for questions, I think. Free software. <laughs> Hello? Hi. Hi. Yes, yeah, so, uh, this is the first time I'm asking a question like that. So, uh, Sorry, could you it point was it? mentioned earlier that uh, having a policy like, say, this software has to be green or try to improve, reduce the, the impact, the environmental impact of the process, making things faster. Um, a friend of mine, he's uh, working in, uh, in construction, road construction. They say that if you build more roads, there will be more traffic. So if you make a software faster, it will be used more and more. It's really a very temporary, at least based on that idea, a very temporary, the opinion is that it's temporary. If you make something faster, if you claim that this software is used to make things faster or to improve the to reduce the let's say the the environmental impact we are just it's a very temporary fix i'm sorry do you have a question <laughs> that's what I'm, I'm saying it's a temporary fix we are by playing uh, but is this a the, question so the the opinion if, is, if it's just a comment i'm sorry we can respond to it and then move on do you want to respond well, to this? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, think, I think the point, one of the points that I think that you raised is that when we create tools, those tools can also enable the various behaviors that we don't want to see happen. You build roads and you're letting traffic happen. And I think that software is a great um, allegory for that. You build software and then people use it to police their societies, to drill oil, to do all these things. But that, that because of that, that's all the more reason why it's incumbent upon us to build these ethical gui um, guardrails in place so that people can develop software knowing and confidence that as long as they enforce their rights in it, that it won't be applied towards these you know, means that you don't want to see happen. Um, I would like to add to that, that let's say you're building a fundamental piece of software like an operating system and you're making it more efficient. It's way better for people to adopt the more efficient operating system than it is to use something that's heavy, clunky, and uses a lot of resources. Thank you, great panel. I have a question. Do you understand software freedom as the freedom of the user to choose how to use the software or as the freedom of the developer to restrict how the user uses the software? <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's, it's both and uh, that the developer has the ability to define the purpose that they are making their work for, um, and the user has certain rights as well. But uh, you know, we have examples all over society of rules about um, users not being. You know, there are limits when, as soon as your use of something causes harm to another person, that use can be restricted. Likewise, if that harm, if that use is a public health risk, it can be restricted. And that's where I think the ability. That's where I think the ability of developers to have some more control comes in. And distributors. Do they have their own mic? Oh, they have their own mic? No, no. Yep. No. Oh, right. <laughs> something to say here? Um, I'd like to open up if there are any women. Uh, uh, I, I agree. Uh, <laughs> it's... <laughs> I don't, I don't think that means I'm concede, conceding uh, to the resolution, but I agree with their response to that. Uh, I'd like to really quickly just uh, ask if there are any women or non-binary folks in the room who would like to ask a question. So do you want to respond? 
Yeah, yeah, sure. While we're waiting for more hands, I would just uh, to, to, to follow up on the response to Mirko's question. I think that it is definitively, if we look to the four freedoms, the freedom of the user receiving the software, and that is what free software depends on. But I think going back to everything that Lewis so eloquently addressed in the previous talk, that sometimes you have to decide where these freedoms need to cave in order to accomplish other goals that are just as, if not even more pressing and important. And I think that that's what the core of this discussion is. Very quick addendum. We're advocating putting uh, the, the items in the license, not in the four freedoms. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Well, hi. Um, so first, the disclaimer uh, is also for me. Um, and my question is for the affirmative team. Over the last decade or so, pretty much all big open source projects, in addition to having an open source license, have a code of conduct. And everything that depends on governance and ethics and describing what is right and what is wrong in the community is defined in the code of conduct and how to handle that. So my question is, if it's easy to do all that in the license, why do we have code of conduct and were we all wrong in the last 10 years? That's a very good question that I feel like I'm the one who's supposed to respond to it. Um, I would make a few quick points, um, which are perhaps that is a place where we need to be looking at uh, including in licensing. Um, codes of conduct uh, govern the behavior of individuals uh, and how they're interacting, um, and also tie into a lot of their like fundamental rights. Um, so challenging that with a license, I think, is a much harder question. Um, like, how do we look at what this means in a legal context, especially as the legal context varies so much country to country? Um, I would also kind of add to that that um, codes of conduct are, like, not always effective. So I want to I thank these uh, debaters here. Of, of all the debates, I think this is the, where the people most had to take positions they don't necessarily agree with. And I thank them for doing that for the pedagogical purposes of this debate. Thank you. Yeah. And so, so uh, we, we're doing questions, uh, brief questions of the whole audience after each debate since we're not doing winners. Uh, ra by raise of hands, how many people learned something about these issues in this debate they didn't know about before they came in? And how many people's minds were on one side of the issue and now are on the other after this debate? Only one. <laughs> three, three, okay. <laughs> but, many, but it looks like a lot of people learned something and we're really glad that you did. Uh, if the debaters could, for the next uh, debate could come down here, please. 